Uh huh. And you an opinion. How do you say that socialism is immoral? All conservatives' later counter argument is that stealing money is immoral. I agree. I think stealing money is immoral. Therefore, socialism is good because it stops the theft of your uh, hard earned dollars. Your bosses steal money from you every fucking day. Now you go to week. Actually, you know what? It's theory time, baby. I think that uh, a good. Uh, a good introduction to theory for some of you as a squirrel, a friend of the show squirrel uh, posted is by um, what's his face? Uh, it's it's uh, Harvey, right? No, not a new segment, but here it's like uh, people that constantly ask about um, people that constantly ask about theory, look no further. Okay, fear no more. Here it is. Hold on, let me just pull this shit up. The game theory. No, this is at the heart of. Uh, he here. This is a. Uh, at the heart of Marx's theory lies the labor theory of value. This will describe that concept fairly well. Okay, here, in, in simplified terms. Confused about what Marx was about. They think he wrote about communism. Was that only a tiny amount of what he wrote was about a future communist society? This is actually about capitalism. or more of what he wrote was about capitalism. So it's his analysis of capitalism that people are interested in because of the, the problems that we're facing at the moment. And that's why it's, it's pertinent. And if you like, I can take you through his, his theory of crisis, which is the kind of central bit um, that's pertinent to what we're Yeah, that'd be fantastic now. if you could, yeah. Well, if you stand over there, and I'll, I'll tell you all about it, right? It starts um, with the labor theory of value, okay, which uh, was not something that Marx invented. This is from Ricardo and Smith, classical economists of the 18th and 19th century. But basically, the labor theory of value says that only people make and create value, right? Machines or flip charts have value. They have use value. Okay, they are useful things, but the flip chart on its own can't do anything. Okay, it can't create more value than it has. The only thing that can create more value out of the flip chart is if somebody does something with it. Somebody does something with it. That's why I always say there is no value without labor, right? If you have a boss and that boss, let's say, magically has a fucking factory and magically we transported wood to that factory, all that boss has without actual labor, without actual people working on those, uh, on those fucking piles of wood, turning it into chairs, is just a factory full of wood. And a lot of times that depreciates too. Um, I'm saying magically, the factory doesn't even build itself, obviously. There's labor associated with that too. Okay. What about, uh, what about automation, asks a chatter. Well, automation also means that there's still people building the robots, just like there's people building the fucking factory. That's why at the heart of all value still exists labor. You cannot have any sort of value without labor. I said automatization. Automation. Did I say automation? Uh, uh, automation. What? Oh my God, my brain. Okay. So that's the basic idea of the labor theory of value. Now, what I'm going to take you through is a very rapid distillation of a pile of books this high. Okay, So uh, um, the, the pure Marxist scholars that might happen upon this will probably be appalled at the way I'm simplifying things. But in order to get the essence of the arguments over, I'll, I'll do the best I can. If we assume this is the working day, okay, it can be divided up into two component parts. All right? Now, this is the average working day. So if you look at it across the global economy, that'll be times, I don't know, 3 billion or however many people are working. Okay. Now, this part here we call the variable capital. This is the, so if we start at 9 o'clock, by about 2 o'clock, okay, I have created enough value to pay for my wages. Okay. All the time that I then work for the rest of the afternoon is creating what Marx calls surplus value. Right? Now, surplus value is the source of profit. Okay. And clearly, if this, this line can move, depending on various changes in the economy, which I'll briefly explain in a moment. 
uh, people be following up correctly so far labor theory of value is not a marxian uh concept originally it's ricardo uh and and adam smith and it's simply an expansion of uh, those uh, uh previous concepts it's also not it's also not uh, now, like fully descriptive. Race... It's also very difficult to calculate uh, purely the the uh, the value, the surplus value that you uh, bring, like your the value that your labor actually uh, creates. Um, it's different. It's entirely different than what uh, classical economists believe in nowadays, where uh, their the, their opinions revolve around marginal utility. Now. Neither of those things are, are exact sciences, and it's still, it's still made up because there is no way to, there is no way to perfectly figure out what value is, right? There's no way to perfectly figure out what value is. Like, I mean, the difference between uh, ice cream, for example, in the summer versus ice cream in the winter, it can can change. If you are an incredibly thirsty person, if you're in a fucking desert, water is incredibly valuable to you. But uh, we don't price it out that way uh, currently. It's an entirely subjective thing, right? You love ice cream, and uh, in the middle of a hot summer day, you want to have ice cream. The value of that ice cream is actually much higher than uh, in the middle of the cold winter when you don't want to have fucking ice cream, or you might not be the kind of person that even enjoys ice cream. So economists try to economists try to figure out uh economists try to figure out what exactly uh the value of a thing is. Yeah. Uh regardless of how uh relative of a concept it is. No, that just means that value is a function of something that includes temporal context. How, who the fuck doesn't enjoy ice cream? Ban them? Anyway, let's keep going. Show of these two, S over V, Marx calls the rate of surplus value. And we'll see how this is crucial in a moment. Okay, that's the first thing. Now, the rate of profit, which is the crucial measure here, is surplus value over variable capital, which is the amount that's funding the wages here okay how much your boss takes away from you in the form of profit versus how much you put back in to justify the wages that you get plus and this thing here called c which marx calls constant capital constant capital as, as in the the uh the depreciating assets that uh, previously existed in the corporation itself like the factory like the robot arm that you might be using or a computer that your uh, that your boss gives you or your company gives you that you're using that you yourself personally might not have had enough money to purchase now this is machinery it's bought in material okay it's 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 leather it's whatever it is we're working with okay paper all right the reason he calls it constant capital is its value does not change okay it is what it is which comes back to this basic idea of the, the labor theory of value now, his theory of crisis uh, is based on what he calls the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall over a business cycle, right? Now, why it falls is actually the, the nub of the argument, okay? He says due to competition in markets, the, the capitalist, the owner of the business, can't fritter away all this surplus value in luxury expenditure, right? A significant proportion of this has to be reinvested to protect himself from competition and to gain a, a march on com competitors. Now, because of technical improvements in the way we make things, okay, the productivity of labor has improved dramatically over the years through the introduction of machines. Yes, there is depreciation as well. It doesn't stay constant. Obviously, these are, this is uh, not like a fully uh, flushed out, um, uh, like in order to fucking make a reductive argument, in order to contextualize these sorts of concepts, of course you're going to fucking uh, drop certain things that occur in reality. This is an oversimplification. It's kind of like 
at the heart of the supply demand uh, uh, curves that you put together, right, in a free market uh, lies the rational actor making rational choices when no such being exists. When we have, for example, a multi-billion dollar industry dedicated to making people uh, make irrational choices. It focuses on the causal variables, so re SOF relevance, what? Relevance while neglecting those that aren't uh, relevant. Machinery. Yeah, now, machinery just... is this bit here, all right, the constant capital. Now, over time, as the businessman invests, the ratio of constant to variable capital increases. There's more machinery working with the individual laborer. What he's basically talking about here is, is something that you can apply to automation as well. Like pretty much in an effort to become more competitive, you're reinvesting the profits that your workers have fucking created for you. Let's say you're a business owner, okay? You've hired a bunch of fucking people and obviously you're underpaying them. That's what is known as profit, right? Uh, and it's uh, totally justifiable in our current understanding of the economy. So you take that profit off the top of every single fucking worker, all right? And you reinvest it. Oftentimes you reinvest it back into your own business so you can be competitive with other businesses that are trying to come into your territory. And that competitiveness uh, manifests itself in automation, for example, that actually increases productivity, right? Automation increases productivity tremendously. If you were an accountant, for example, in the accountant factory, you used to fucking have to use an abacus and uh, pen and paper. Now, boom, Fucking hundred years later, you have a computer. Your productivity is increased by a thousand million fold, maybe. Okay. All of a sudden, you're fucking crunching numbers like crazy. Uh, you have a calculator or you have a fucking computer with a built in calculator. You no longer need the abacus. Now you're fucking cranking out a thousand of these fucking things that uh, previously you were able to do only one or two. The, the, your productivity is skyrocketed. The constant variable there has uh has obviously increased as well because now you have a fucking now you have excel that you have to pay for now you have a laptop that you need to pay for you couldn't get it on your own you couldn't become an accountant on your own however the the rate of profit is increasing on top of that your uh, your surplus labor value is increasing on top of that and the the value that you're generating for the corporation that justifies your uh that that the value that you're generating for the corporation is increasing, whereas the value that the corporation is paying you is decreasing. Okay, and then you can see this manifested in process industries, for example, where you just see a mass of pipe work and about two blokes with a hard hat in the corner. I mean, that would be an extreme case, but the general tendency is still there to, to replace living labor, which is the V bit, with what he calls dead labor, which is the constant capital. Software does most of it and you just double check things. Yeah. No, for sure. The topic you were talking about when different terms are worth more in different situations is known as demand. Are you just throwing words out? No, I'm not. I know he sounds a lot like Sasha Baron Cohen, by the way. I can't get over it. But. Now so. The crucial concepts introduced here is central to Marx's critical analysis of capitalism and theory of crises, the law of tendency of the rate of profit to fall over a business cycle through the increase in the ratio of constant variable capital, machining, machines replacing uh, the labor. So now we have the core concepts and now they function as a part of a broader framework. Recent research by Piketty has confirmed living labor is being replaced by dead labor at a high rate. Now let's move on to the next step. So how does this lead to a crisis? So now you have automation. Now you have machinery replacing the fucking uh, the labor that you were doing. Obviously, in, in uh, earlier eras of industrialization, you have so many different fucking people that are sitting on an assembly line and, uh, and, and working on an assembly line. Now you don't need that. Now you've automated most parts of that. Um, with literally the profits that those motherfuckers originally on the assembly line generated for the corporation. So you are working, at a, you are working in, the, in the factory. You're working in the racism factory because, of course... You're a white working class laborer, so obviously your output is racism, right? And you're doing the racism on the assembly line, and all of a sudden, all the extra, <laughs> all of the all of the additional surplus uh, labor value is still accumulating at the top, 
and your boss is like, all right, we're going to find a better way to do racism now. Okay. We're going to find a, an automated process uh, to, to automate certain parts of the racism. Now the output's even fucking higher. Now you as an individual have the capacity to create even more racism. Okay. You have even the capacity to produce even more racism. And yet your boss is like, all right, well, we don't fucking need some of these racists now. So we're going to fire off some of these racism factory workers because we don't need all of that. We don't need these people to, to work anymore. Time through this process of accumulation, which is not an option for a capitalist, he has to do this, okay? This ratio, C over V, which he calls the organic competition of capital, not a particularly helpful term, but that ratio increases over time. Now, here's the trick. If we now divide through this equation here by V, okay, we then get S over V divided by C over V plus one. Okay, now, if this increases, as we've just explained, over a, a business cycle, and this ratio, the ratio of, of surplus value, or the rate of surplus value, if that increases at a lower speed than this, then overall this equation, which is the rate of profit, okay, that goes down. Right. Now, he calls it the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. There are counteracting influences which can delay the onset of this effect. One of them is if you have improvements in productivity in wage goods producing industries, the amount of value that's, that's needed to pay wages, if you like, or to feed the workers, etc., etc., can reduce. So that line can go that way. So surplus value can increase. You can increase this by speeding up production lines. So the individual hour of the worker's time produces more stuff. You can, in fact, extend the working day as France has done recently. They tried to reduce it, they've had to extend it because they're, they're not competitive with the, with the reduced working day. And foreign trade and globalization, as other things that Marx suggested, can reduce the tendency of this to fall. But, and what's happened in, in the current situation, in my view, is that we've delayed the onset of this because these are all value terms based on labor time. These are not money terms, okay? And if you've expanded credit, which they have done over the past eight, ten years, then you can delay the monetary expression of the falling rate of profit. But the underlying, and this is Marx's method, okay, the underlying structure of the economy is reflected here, not in the money appearance of the economy. Why is Alpha Chat crying? Why didn't didn't they want a um a theory stream? I don't know. I feel like I, I feel like it's uh it, it's still it's still not exactly easy to describe. I, I think that I don't know if this is like as good. But is here this? We've come to the crucial part of the ratio S uh, uh, divided by V increased at a lower rate than C divided by V, living wage, living labor being replaced by dead uh, labor. The rate of profit goes down. That's it. That's the logic of capitalism. But it's a tendency because there are counteracting influences. And then the crisis hits. The crisis causes businesses to go, go bust. Okay. There's also consolidations within industries where firms combine together. Sometimes in some process industries, there's mothballing of plants, right? Now what that- So all, all businesses under a capitalist organization of the economy operate to monopolize as best as they can. Some businesses is a little bit easier because uh, there is a natural barrier of entry, like, uh, you know, uh, robust uh, capital needs to, to, you know, create a fucking nuclear power plant, for example. You can't be a utility provider if you don't have a fuckload of money ahead of time that you can build a, a factory or ISPs do this by relying on publicly funded infrastructure, right? You need roads, you need those fucking, <laughs> you need roads to be built, you need, uh, you, you need infrastructure so you can, you know, uh, pump your uh, data through. I'm, I'm just using really reductive terms, but, um, but ultimately all businesses want to monopolize. That's why without regulation, without without some sort of government uh regulation 
everything is going to turn into Amazon. What does Amazon do? They fucking outcompete by by uh, pricing the products that they are hosting on their website uh, to a to a level that is like impossible to fucking compete with as a smaller business. They uh, they oftentimes then draw they they destroy the competition this way and then increase the price uh, if they want to as long as it doesn't go uh high as long as it doesn't go above a certain line where like people are frustrated by it and people start recognizing it uh then they're fine and then they're able to do whatever the fuck they want and they can uh they can uh, ruin conditions on the back end because the consumer is not being impacted by it to justify the uh the lower prices okay that diaper site they took out they took like a 40 plus million uh, loss for a month to wipe them out yeah exactly um that's the way that and and uh, due to the financialization of our economy uh, all of these companies start sucking one another up they do uh vertical and and horizontal integration where they will either go and like buy the factory that produces the product if you're a retailer or they buy the fucking logistics operation in between. Amazon uh, building out its own like delivery infrastructure is another example of this. Walmart does this as well. Like making their own, producing. You're no longer a retailer now. Now you're also fucking expanding vertically on different uh, parts of the supply chain. So you control every part of it, every aspect of this. You can do it horizontally as well by purchasing other companies that are competitors in the field. Uh, this is how every single company in America... It has become one mega corporation for the most part. That's why most commodities that you purchase when you go to a Ralph's, for example, is owned by six fucking, uh, six fucking multinational uh, corporations that produce them. There's like a million different diverse products that you can choose from, but a million different diverse products that you can choose from are still being created by six mega corporations, right? Now, there are certain rules set in place to uh, stop this from happening like well there's still six corporations that doesn't mean it's a monopoly hassan yes it is what is known as an oligopoly now in oligopolies if like png and and i don't know what's another fucking commodity producer like out of the six companies that make all this shit um like nestle and and PNG or Unilever uh, it got together, okay, and went and their CEOs sat in a fucking dark room where there's a cigar smoke everywhere, okay, and they were smoking their big uh, Cuban cigars and said, "Hey, you see, we are going to increase the prices of our product. You should do the same." That would be considered price fixing. That, my friends, is illegal. But what can they do instead of? price fixing well what they can do I, I shouldn't use nestle and unilever and whatever i should probably use like um you sh i should probably use the analogy of of isps or or maybe even um you know yeah isps is better so at&t can expand or or time warner can purchase uh, uh charter and then charter can purchase uh another company and then turn into spectrum right they turn into spectrum, so that's horizontal and vertical expansion occurring right there. But then they turn around and fucking, uh, they turn around and 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 follow suit when Verizon decides to uh, change their prices, and and this is exactly how they can fuck you over in a process known as price leadership and not price fixing. The difference between price fixing and price leadership is one company decides to act. Uh, and then the other companies follow suit because they can do that in an oligopoly and it still would not be considered illegal. Whereas if they were to sit in a dark room and decide this is what we're going to do with our prices, then that would be illegal. Okay. A lot of what, a lot of what occurs under capitalism or under Western liberal capitalist democracies basically is just legitimizing and normalizing things that you would otherwise consider to be indecent. The difference between price leadership and price fixing is a perfect example of this. Just like the difference between bribery and campaign contributions are a perfect example of this. Um, 
Campaign contributions are considered legalized bribery, but because it's legal, it's justifiable and good. Bribery, on the other hand, well, that's unacceptable. That's really bad. I mean, those barbarians, they're the ones who are doing, uh, they're the ones who are doing uh, bribery. That's fucked up. We don't do that here. We have lobbying. We have an entire industry uh, where we can uh, bribe our, our politicians to represent our interests over the interests of the people. So that's basically what we do here in the Western world. And that's why we have this like supremacist attitude. Um, okay. So a simple example is competing gas stations on the same corner of the road. One gas station raises their prices and then the other one across the road follows an hour later. Yeah. That does is it takes C out of the system. Constant capital is then taken out of the system. So this reduces. As businesses go bust, the reserve army of unemployed, as Marx called it, increases. That places downward pressure on wages, okay? Because people are competing for jobs, they'll take a job at a lower pay, etc. And what yep. that does is it reduces V. Or another, another thing that we have in America is uh, crippling loans that you need to take to become a competitive uh, a competitive person in the labor market, okay? At the international level, we are trying to outcompete the labor market of other countries. And also at the domestic level, we are trying to compete with one another. And that's why you go to college because it's the only way that you can have upward social mobility. And the only way to go to college with the insane fucking prices is if you take out a fat loan. So now you have a fat loan that you need to pay the fuck off. Those loans transfer over to your fucking family if you don't pay it off. That's insane right? Those loans you took when you're at the age of 17 to get upward social mobility are now transferring to your fucking family if you don't pay it off, even if you fucking die. So what do you do? Well, you suck it the fuck up and you take a job that you normally otherwise would never take, regardless of whether you are overqualified for it. And you take that job that has uh, no benefits whatsoever, that doesn't even have like applicable, uh, applicable like uh, field uh, uh like the 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 qualif the qualifications that you learned in fucking college and that's another way that you uh apply pressure to the labor force and subjugate them to a lifetime of wage slavery pretty much okay so if we've if we've reduced that and we've reduced that then overall that equation gets restored the rate of profit recovers and then we're back on another cycle of accumulation um, which might last 10 years 15 years who knows you can't predict with any degree of certainty here but that's the basic theory okay and that's maybe why people are looking to buy das capital okay and eventually actually um you know it all falls down and that's the we just degree of certainty here but that's the basic theory okay and that's maybe why people are looking to buy desk capital in these periodic crises which are intrinsic to the capitalism constant capital is destroyed while unemployment reduces variable capital restoring the balance however what is not mentioned there but marx did note was that these crises will only get worse over time now i believe marx and assessment was correct in his analysis of capitalism and its logic and it's asinine to pretend otherwise we are witnessing firsthand how constant capital is rapidly replacing variable capital in the form of AI and automation, as uh, Squirrel also mentions, which means that ever greater crises await us in the near future and the means by which they can be diminished and the balance can be restored are becoming unavailable. So one of the main criticisms of, um, one of the main criticisms of, of uh, Marx's analysis, for example, Um, is is the fact that the the inevitable contradictions, the inevitable contradictions that I've also described uh, between workers and bosses, those who own capital, uh, that I've described uh, in in simple terms as like a worker wants to work the least amount of hours for the most amount of pay, the boss wants the the worker to work the most amount of hours for the least amount of pay, and therein lies a contradiction that is unsolvable under capitalism, uh, especially when the bosses get all of the surplus value of your labor as. Uh, my man described over here. Um, 
Marx thought that uh, that these these problems would inevitably these inherent contradictions would inevitably lead to economic collapse. However, what we could not have foreseen at the time was the welfare state, social democracy, uh, and and what the state will do to basically soften the blow of these, uh, these uh, times of economic crisis in an effort to continue capitalism. Get it? And that's where the state props up these inevitable, uh, the, the, the inevitable ends of that crisis that we speak of, where the state will continue through welfare reform and through, a certain, uh, through certain policies that uh, the, our capitalist organization of the economy. Okay? Now, we've gotten to a certain point, reminds me of the housing bubble, we've gotten to a certain point where, like, we're so buck wild. Our state is so buck wild that in the aftermath of the housing crisis, for example, instead of giving, instead of paying off those mortgages personally, the state decided to literally fucking pay the banks. Um, and, and in which case, people that fucking got those houses were still evicted. Okay? With certain conditions on how you could use those loans, even though the banks, of course, did not follow a lot of those conditions. The reason why they could do this, the reason why they can openly do this, is one, because it's convoluted. It's a complicated concept to understand. And part of the reason why they can do this is because you have no way to push back. Because what are you going to do? There's no way that you could potentially put together an organized uh, unit of workers to collectively bargain for your better interest. There is no way that you can, you can actually fight back against this. And what I'm referencing isn't even what Republican administrations have done, even though Republican administrations have been responsible for a lot of this uh, cruelty. Democratic administrations have done this as well. I mean, Obama's recovery efforts is a great example of this. Neoliberal Democratic administrations have also uh, uh, further, uh, have also exacerbated the cruelty that you experience. Now, I believe Marx in essence was correct in his analysis of the case, which means that ever greater crises, crises await us in the near future, and by the means that can be diminished in the balance, can be restored or becoming unavailable, and some among the bourgeoisie know it, which is why they're pushing neoliberal UBI proposals. The only thing we don't know is whether they'll be successful in creating some kind of neoliberal hellscape, where most can barely survive through some UBI while they live as kings, or whether we'll go extinct through climate change or, you know, socialism. Oh, the full video by Cliff Bowman. Uh, the best video intro of some sorts of Marx's uh, core economic policies is right here. We can watch the rest of it too if you want. Kind of on topic, Nestle uh, is in the news today for defending child slavery in front of the Supreme Court. Nice. U.S. Supreme Court justice on Tuesday appeared wary of bar barring lawsuits against American companies over alleged human rights abuse abroad, but signaled they could toss out a case accusing Cargill, Inc., and a Nestle SA subsidiary of knowingly helping perpetuate slavery at the Ivory Coast Cocoa Farms. Another part is, is palm oil, right? That's like a, a really a horrifying, uh, the, the conditions that uh, people that Neil cut y'all listen to his court hearings. That shit was funny. You got to hear the audio Twitter feeds. Yeah, the lawyer that is arguing on behalf of the megacorps here was uh, Obabe's uh, solicitor general, if I'm not mistaken. That's what I was. That's what I was showing. Environmental disaster from palm oil production. Yeah. What about people like you that make decent money on this platform? We are the true evil. People like myself are actually the real problem. Nestle that is, uh, you know, utilizing child slavery, for example, that's just regular capitalism. 
me describing that regular capitalism to you in a palatable way and also getting money as a consequence of that because you find my labor in this way to be uh, useful and also entertaining. Well, no, I am the real uh, problem, actually, not Nestle, uh, because I don't know why, actually. I don't know why you would literally look at that and, and, and think that, like, even after everything that I've just described to you, that I am the fucking real problem. Uh, yeah, but you're a champagne socialist. Stop pretending you're a Marxist. Yeah, I, I don't really care. Yeah, I am a champagne socialist. Here, I'm literally drinking Fiji water right now. Yeah, I like luxury items too. Despite the fact that I don't really use a lot of luxury items, I, I, I think that people should be able to have them. As a matter of fact, I think no matter what the economic organization we exist under, there should be some form of, of a hedonistic... Uh, interests that soothe the the masses so sock them perpetuate the system of oppression but give out temporary band-aids to make it tolerable yes but there is still a necessity for uh, a transitional social uh democ democratic state uh and also no matter what the fuck you talk about there is not a single country on this planet that does not agree with me including the dengue's favorite china okay yeah, go ahead. I just triggered the fuck out of the tanky uh, nerds. Even if you are looking at China from a, the most charitable, even if you are looking at China from the most charitable fucking Marxian ec economist perspective, point of view, that's still a social uh, democracy uh, at this moment. It is not a transitional socialist state. It is a transitional social democracy. So there you go, dingus. Suck my dick. Anyway. Are you proposing an eventual end to democracy? What? No. I'm proposing more democracy. Oh, also, I didn't run the ad before, but I'm going to run it now. Oh, forgot. Here, I'll show you this chart real quick as well, but... Um... Top of the hour every hour. There's a 60 second ad break. We're running it right now. Shut the fuck up. All you know is porn star vagina and be bad at video game. Yet you're rich. What the fuck? Fuck them, Zara. At least in Sweden, closely connected to the collective bargaining movement and the trade unions. They went centrist to cope with popular sport because nationalism and tribalism are such strong forces. The outrage be fucking livid? What? <sighs> Here. Wage theft is when employers steal from employees other types of theft yearly. Uh, data from the United States, larceny, burglary, auto theft, and robbery, which is the tiniest part of it. But overtime violations, rest break violations. I think this is from the Labor Bureau statistics, right? Uh, off the clock violations, minimum wage violations of the tune of 23.20 billion. None of that is considered to be, um, none of that is, is prosecuted with the same level of, of aggressiveness as this. I agree that a transitional period of quote social democracy or market socialism is needed, but I still hate sock teams because I think they're that the transitional period should be permanent. And it just defeats the whole purpose. They're so close but fall so short.
Why do some leftists care so much about the name of their ideology when the end goal is always a communist society? I don't Well, that's not true. The end goal isn't a communist society for some leftists. Um What is the best way to abolish capitalism in the US when so many of our jobs and products rely on the international supply chains of private corporations? Welfare is still good? Yeah, I don't I I I'm a firm believer in like uh I'm a firm believer in in uh making gains wherever you can and uh trying to trying to reduce the the harm that the working class is subjected to anywhere that you can anywhere that you can make uh material gains is good is a positive in america especially social democrats uh, who at least know enough to consider themselves social democrats are still absolutely fucking uh, uh aligned with uh, my interest I don't know if they're not aligned with yours, but I don't know what your fucking interests are, what kind of delusional worldview you have, especially when considering the fact that Bernie Sanders himself ran basically uh, with uh, modest social democratic reforms. So. The DOJ is what? 